Hey, Alice, are we ready to go? We are. Awesome. So welcome Wahi members and Audubon friends and friends of friends. We're so excited that you're able to join us this afternoon for our next environmental and cultural speaker series. Uh, today we're going to be working, having a great presentation with um, Kay Grinnell from the Audubon Society. She's a board member there, as well as with Sarah Gustafson, who is a Wahi member and uh, my 40 year uh, lifelong friend. So we're very excited to have this program this afternoon. Um, we're gonna start, hopefully you all enjoyed the uh, wonderful informative presentation that we were scrolling there. We thought we would do information sharing a little bit different in today's presentation. And um, we just really wanna appreciate Alice Schulte, who's our yeah, communication you know, expert, putting that together and trying something new. So thank you. Many thanks to Alice and we raise her up for that. Um, we're gonna roll right over to Pat Fall, our program chair for this year. And Pat's going to introduce Kay and get our show started. All right, welcome yeah. all Wahi ladies and guests. I have the privilege of uh, introducing Kay Grinnell to you all tonight. Kay is a retired business consultant with 20 plus years of advising top executives on matters of strategy and operations as a Deloitte partner. Since her retirement, she has embraced her longtime love of nature by serving on several environmentally oriented boards, including the Marine Cons Conservation Institute. Hey, Pat, we just had a, a sound drop out of you. I know, somebody muted me, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, someone muted me. Okay. Um, she's past board chair and current treasurer for the Nature Conservancy South Carolina chapter. She also currently serves as co-chair for the Nature Conservancy Southern U.S. Division Trustee Cabinet. Kay volunteers with local organizations to give talks and leads walks to encourage respect for our environment. She and her husband, Phil, enjoy walking, bird watching, and boating in natural areas around the world, but especially near their home here in South Carolina, the Low Country. Kay's gonna talk, and if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box, and she'll be happy to answer your questions at the end of her talk. Welcome, Kay. Thank you, Pat. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today, and appreciate <clears throat> all of you who are here, especially given the beauty of the outside right now. <laughs> Well, um, I'm hoping that by the end of this session that you'll feel comfortable with the answers to five questions. And those questions are, what's Audubon? Who is Hilton Head Audubon? What's the New Hall Preserve? What's the Christmas bird count? And how can you get involved? So let's start off the answer to the first question with a video. If you're watching this video, there's a good chance you already know who we are. Need a hint? But we have the inkling of an idea that a lot of people don't really know what we do or why we exist. So we decided to take it to the streets to find out what is Audubon? Autobahn Society? Audubon, 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 Audubon. I know, I know, I know you got the Audubon ball rule. Is it something to do with a German highway? It sounds German. Someone who is in independent. Let me Google it. Do you know what the Audubon Society is? <clears throat> yes, birds. That's right, person on the street. But let's start from the beginning. The National Audubon Society began its roots in 1896 when Harriet Hemingway and Mina Hall organized to convince societies to stop wearing hats donned with real By 1898, state level Audubon societies was founded an environmental nonprofit dedicated to conserving birds and their habitats. And of course, our society is named in honor of the one and only John James Audubon, an ornithologist and naturalist who painted and cataloged the birds of North America in the 19th century. 
So that was a little history lesson, but you might be wondering, who is Audubon? More than 100 years later, Audubon is now a group of conservationists, storytellers, and advocates, many of whom work directly on lands around the country to preserve precious bird habitats. An award-winning magazine in which we publish stories about birds and issues that affect them in the world we all share. An educator for the environmentalists of our future. A host for the annual Audubon Photography Awards, a contest that shows bird life at its most vivid, vulnerable, and elegant. A pioneer in research. For example, using science-backed climate models to predict how birds in the U.S. and Canada will react to climate change. An environmental organization with almost 500 local chapters. No, seriously, we have a lot of chapters. There's most likely an Audubon chapter, center, or sanctuary in your state if you don't know about it already. And yes, we're also a bunch of die-hard bird people. The National Audubon Society means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But in the end, everything we do is to protect the birds and wildlife around us, their habitats, and the living, breathing planet we all call our home. What does Audubon mean to you? If you're well, that's National Audubon, but who is Hilton Head Audubon? Our second question. Well, we were founded in chartered as a, as a chapter of National Audubon in 1975, and we currently have a little over 200 members. You won't be surprised to see that our mission and vision are very much in concert with those things that you just heard from National Audubon, with of course, a little bit more of a focus on Hilton Head and the low country areas. But who really are we? Well, I think that much like you, we're bird and nature lovers. We're also citizen scientists. We get involved in education a lot with both children and adult. And we're conservationists and, and we get involved in the community and we collaborate with some organizations that you've probably heard of like the Coastal Conservation League and um, Coastal Discovery Museum on topics that you've probably heard of, things like the um, Bay Point Development Resort or perhaps the refuse dump off of Beach City Road for Arbor Nature. We heard, by the way, yesterday that that permit has been approved. So we're scurrying to heal that. But most of all, um, we're all of the things above and we're also volunteers. The photo collection of the things we are on the top left, you see one of our members with kids in kayaks in the center of a field trip on the right, we collaborated with uh, both South Carolina Audubon and the Coastal Discovery Museum to do a, a small educational thing with Hilton Head Elementary about shorebird protection and the need for it. And then we had a, a drawing contest and the kids who won got to have their drawings put onto signs. And if you find some of the beach access on the island, you'll see these signs on the beach access. One of our citizen science projects is Osprey Watch and Every single nest on Hilton Head is observed and reported on. Um, we're starting right around now when Mr. and Mrs. Osprey are just getting together on the nest. And it goes through uh, the summer when the Osprey eggs are laid, hatched, and the chicks are fledged. So we do a lot of different things at Hilton Head Audubon. Your third question, what's the Audubon New Hall Preserve? Hopefully you have been there as a birder, as a, someone who likes nature. If not, maybe you've at least noticed the sign as you drove by off Palmetto Bay Road. It is, was established in 1965. We have during the season bird walks and talks and we get hundreds of visitors there every year. Last year around February, we were thrilled to find out that Wahi was, um, had approved a grant for us and we at Audubon used it at the Newhall Preserve to uh, pay for a watering system so that we could plant a pollinator garden near the pond. Um, what you see on the top left is our socially distanced volunteers planting uh, 37 different species of pollinator plants um, in the garden by the pond. And we very much appreciate that grant. Peter Kieran, who coordinated between Audubon and uh, Wahi, volunteered to give Wahi ladies a tour 
to see the um, pollinator garden. She suggested that late spring is the best time because all the flowers will be blooming. So um, you can contact me or Rita Kiernan to arrange that if you'd like. That is uh, whoever in Wahi arranges things like that. Our fourth question is what is the Christmas bird count? Or as one of my neighbors once posed to me, why in the world would anyone want to go out and count all those birds? Let's again start it off with a video. The Christmas bird count was started in 1900 as an alternative activity to overhunting. <clears throat> there was an activity called the side hunt that was done during the holiday period, which really epitomized the overharvest of wildlife. In the latter half of the 1800s, many populations of birds were in decline, especially colonial nesting seabirds and egrets and herons. Feathers and plumes were very much in vogue, both on women's hats and also in other accoutrements of fashion. Not only were individual feathers and plumes used, but oftentimes even whole birds were seen on hats. Literally entire breeding colonies were being extirpated in a given season by uh, the feather hunters. The growing conservation awareness at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s grabbed onto the egrets as the poster child of these birds in decline, and the egret became the symbol of the fledgling Audubon societies at the time. Frank Chapman, who was an ornithologist at the American Museum of Natural History, was among many people who were realizing that conservation was necessary, and he proposed the idea of doing a Christmas bird census rather than a holiday bird hunt. That first year, there were counts done in 25 locations by 27 people across the continent, actually, and it's been done every year since 1900. My name is Jeff LeBaron. I'm director of the Christmas Bird Count for National Audubon Society. I've always loved birds. Birds actually gave me the ability to realize that you can engage other people in the environment because they're so captivating. They're, they're beautiful, they're fascinating, they do amazing things, and there are lots of different kinds of them. And with a little bit of effort, you can actually have a very up close and personal encounter with birds. Literally every human being on the face of the earth on any given day can go out and see a bird. But I don't think there's any other kind of animal or wildlife that you can say that about. In the present day, the Christmas bird count has grown tremendously. We now have over 60,000 observers out in over 2,200 locations across the hemisphere. One of the important things that the Christmas bird count data set enables us as scientists to do is to answer the popular question that we get all the time, how are the birds doing? It's a complicated question, really, because some birds are actually doing very well, while many groups are actually doing very poorly. Another really important thing that we've learned from the Christmas bird count data set is how are birds responding to changing winter conditions, early winter conditions. We've learned in the Birds and Climate Change report that a number of species have actually significantly changed the center of their abundance as seen during the Christmas bird count and over 60 of them actually have shifted their range more than 100 miles northward in the last 50 years. I'll just point out that that video was a few years old, so there is more and new data about how the birds are doing. 
each organization that does a Christmas bird count is assigned a circle and all of the count circles are a 15 mile diameter. This is a map that shows all of the Christmas bird counts that were done in 2019. And I love the statistics on the bottom left. You can see updated from what uh, Jeff just talked about on the video. There were in 2019 over 81,000 observers out in the field and watching feeders in their home. And they counted more than 42 million birds and they identified more than 2,500 different species. Of course, the map isn't quite as dense as it looks on that big one. When you look at the East Coast and then you look at our part of the Southeast, you can see that the count circles get a little sparser. And on the right, you can see an arrow to our own Hilton Head uh, count circle. In this area, we have three count circles. On the top left, you see the Sun City one. On the top right is the uh, one we call North Beaufort County. And on the bottom center is our Hilton Head Audubon bird count area. We did manage to have a 2020 bird count uh, in a socially distanced manner. We had 19 team captains. Those were 15 uh, teams that were out in the field. And four, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of water in our area, four actually captains of boat teams. And uh, our tentative results, and I say tentative because it takes a year for Audubon reviews to go through and for them to publish the results. For tentative results, we had 149 participants uh, in December, 135 species identified, and we actually counted over 26,000 birds. Um, we're very proud of the fact that in 2019, which is the last published data, we in a, the Hilton Head Audubon Count Circle had 346 participants, which of all those count circles you saw on that map of over 2,000 was the fourth highest number. So back to that question that um, is the most obvious one about the Christmas bird count, how are the birds doing? And the answer today is that while the number of count circles and the number of observers is dramatically increasing as people get more interested in birds over the years, the total number of birds counted is dramatically declining. And of course, scientists are studying and trying to figure out the number of reasons for this complex question of why is this happening. The last question is how can you get more involved? And unlike probably a lot of you, I am not a photographer, but I have to say this is my picture of a painted bunting in the backyard and I rather enjoy it. You can see that I'm not a photographer because I didn't touch up the what looks like a dirty bird feeder. I couldn't resist the uh, title to this slide, um, who can get involved in the birding community. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that you can do without actually making much of any commitment. Uh, we have a local birding email group. We chat back and forth about, in fact, I saw one today on the, on the uh, emails that said, spring migration is beginning. And it talked about some red starts being seen in the area. You can post photos and ask some of the other birders, what is this bird that I saw in my yard? Uh, and a variety of other things. I happen to be the moderator for that email group. So if you would like to join it, um, just uh, contact me and I'll give you my contact information in a minute. Um, you can volunteer for the next Christmas bird count. You don't have to be an Audubon member to volunteer. The amazing woman who leads the Christmas bird count is Susan Murphy and here's her email address or you can contact me and I'll put you in touch with her. And we are on social media, Facebook. We have a Hilton Head Audubon um, website and you can also find photos from us on Instagram. But of course, you won't be surprised to know that what I would recommend is that you just go ahead and join Audubon. Um, we have things for birders. We have things for experienced birders. We have monthly um, member speakers that are nature talks. Um, we have a lot of committees and lots of opportunities to volunteer and get involved. And if you have uh, questions they don't want to talk about on this forum or um, would like to contact me for any of the other things to get involved, here's my contact information. Feel free to call, text, or email me. And now if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Hey there, Kay, it's Alice. Uh, we did get one um, 
question come into the chat box so far yep. um, and, other, and other people that could start uh, putting questions in now. Um, from Elaine Parker, I see brown pelicans here on the May River. Do they nest nearby? From what I know, there are some pelican um, rookeries offshore on some of the islands and um, most of the pelican rookeries are out there offshore. I don't think they nest um, inland on our, on our rivers. I'm going to take my contact information down so that I can see the chats. Oh, well, we didn't need to have my big face there. Okay. Are there any other questions? Here's another one. Um, okay, hang on one second. Let me bring the chat box up. Is it not coming up for me? Oh, I see some. So we've got mm -hmm. from Jan the question of she joined last year and registered for the birding 101 class, but it was full. Is that class happening this year? You know, I'm not sure. Um, a, a lot of things are different, as you would imagine, due to COVID. And um, I don't know where COVID's going to be, so I can't actually say what's going to happen. Um, I'm sorry that the class was full. We, we were uh, amazed at the interest in that class and are hoping to have multiple classes this year, but we have to wait and see how COVID goes. Well, given that we've got 68 ladies online right now for our uh, presentation, I think there's a lot of interest in birding and being outside in nature. I so uh, pretty awesome, Kay. Another question from Mary, is there a website that has photos of common Hilton Head birds? There are a number of websites that um, some of our members have. Um, I'm trying to think of, I, uh, there might be common head, Hilton Head birds on our website. I honestly don't remember. Okay. Lynn, can you help me with that? Anybody else? Yeah. There are a number of um, great books that are um, about birds in our area. And um, you can see the bookshelf behind me. I can tell you that about 90% of those are bird books. Um, some of them are for other countries, but there are a lot of really great books about birds in the low country, et cetera. I would imagine that if you do a Google search, you can find uh, a number of websites that have great pictures. I think on them Sarah well. might have some resources also in her presentation coming up as well. We've got a couple other um, questions bet. that are coming in, Kay. What is the, um, what are some, if any, endangered birds in the low country? Well, um, I think the bald eagle is still considered, well, they just came off the endangered species list. Um, yeah, and, and to that end, when you're thinking about that, also there's a question from Merrill about, is the resurgence of the bald eagle affecting the osprey population? So that might be a, a good one to answer at the same time. Well, that's a fabulous question. I think we should try to get a speaker to tell us about that. Um, the the uh, resurgence of the bald eagles is pretty remarkable. Um, I'm the team leader for the Pinckney Island bird count, the Christmas bird count. And uh, our team of 14 people counted, and it's possible there were some repeats and we try to sort that out, but we counted, I think, 15 bald eagles on that day. And there were, um, uh, I think, 30 some bald eagles counted around the island that were concluded not repeat. So the bald eagle resurgence is amazing. And the osprey population is doing fabulously. So I don't really know that right now they may be competing with each other, but they both seem to be doing really wonderfully. We've got a couple of members that have uh, said that the piper, piping plover and the red knots are threatened. Uh, piping plover is endangered and red knots are threatened. I love ah. having bird watching members to answer the questions for me. Thank you. <laughs> And Jane Bush asks, uh, are your reports indicating a decrease in all birds or specific ones uh, saying that she noticed fewer cardinals than she used to see like 15 years ago? I do know, and you may have seen the headlines. I think it was in, in 2019. Um, there were big headlines about the dramatic drop in the number of songbirds. And um, 
I'm not sure if this is the primary reason, but we do have a lot of songbirds that migrate. And part of the problem, the challenge for birds in the environment is even if the places that they inhabit here in the United States are still available to them, the places that they migrate to may not be available. And migration is, is a dangerous process. If they go through the Caribbean, some of the islands shoot birds be, for various reasons. Um, so uh, songbirds are definitely one of the categories that are dropping dramatically. And that probably is why your cardinals are less frequent. Hey, I've got a question from Linda. Other than Pinckney, are there any other colonies of egrets and herons that nest on Hilton Head? There are, they tend to be smaller ones. Um, I've, I've seen over years um, a smaller colony and it's, you know, Pinckney is a, a really big colony, but if you have uh, 50 birds in a colony, still pretty big. I've seen ones in Hilton Head Plantation and they tend to migrate over time to different locations because they stay there for a few years in a row and Frankly, they just foul the place up. It stinks and it's nasty. And so they decide to go to another place together. Um, I'm guessing uh, there are some in sea pines. And if anybody, you guys are good at answering your own questions. If anybody knows of other even here in colonies, I do know that there are also some on Defusky. Awesome. Well, I, I don't see any more questions coming in right now for Kay, so we thank Kay. Um, we know that uh, she did have some internet uh, challenges on her end with some um, members coming in with some comments in the chat pod around pixelated videos and presentation. So we'll make sure that we get the videos out with a link as well as the presentation slides so you all can view them as well after the fact to make sure that you get that information. Um, we so much appreciate Kay and, and coming as well as your um, most generous offer to get together at the Newhall Preserve and the Pollinator Garden. And I'll be back in touch with you on that front as well, Kay. Sounds great. Uh, Thank you. So we are uh, gonna move on with Sarah Gustafson. She is our WAHI member and she's also my 40 year old lifelong, my 40 year lifelong friend. She hails from Virginia, which includes the University of, so Wahoo Wada Sarah. Um, she came to Hilton Head uh, in COVID uh, because she's waiting for a Peace Corps posting to Namibia. And she's still waiting for that posting and, and given the current situation, maybe waiting a lot longer. So we're really delighted that she's been able to be involved with our association this year. With Wahi, she's been doing pickle and golf. So y'all made it better that way. And basically anything I drag her to go to, she comes along as well. Um, she's a finance and accounting professional, uh, worked for Pricewaterhouse around in uh, Russia, London, Brussels, Australia. She's world traveler and mostly an avid birder. And she had her big, big year last year, I think over 500 Sarah birds. 507. 507 birds. If any of y'all have seen the Steve Martin, Owen Wilson movie, The Big Year, that's something that you might want to do for homework. It's quite, it's great fun. And that talks about the big year. And she can talk about that a little bit more. Um, she's my go-to person for when I spot a bird. Um, usually I will send her an e a quick little text message with a picture and say, what is this? No. And then she'll say, no, Tamara, it's not a flamingo. It's a rosate spoonbill. Or um, when the red shoulder hawk flew into my front door and was in my porch for a couple hours, what do I do now? That's Sarah who I call to say help. And she convinced me to participate in the Christmas bird count this year as a backyard feeder observer. And uh, it was great fun to do that um, as well and experience and get a little bit more smart on that um, conservation history with the Audubon. So over to Sarah and her presentation. Okay, um, I'm gonna be answering some questions. Tamara sent me to just give some structure to um, my talk. I don't have specific objectives other than to um, let you know about birding and how much fun it is um, and hopefully to convince you to go out birding. So the first question she's asked me was what got me interested in birding and it dates back to about 20 years ago when um, I was coming back from living overseas, wasn't working. And I got to lie in bed in the morning and I kept hearing bird song and not having to go get up and go to work. I'm like, what is this? What is this? And I'd listen to it every morning. And I finally went out into my backyard and um, figured out what birds were singing 
and it was very exciting to to start to become a birder um hold on one sec i need to put on my glasses to get my slideshow going so Kay was a Kay was a pioneer for us on our zoom meeting because she's our first presenter that's ever used video so we've got some lessons learned out of that experience i don't think sarah's got any video in her presentation right now uh i don't but i have an animation so hopefully the animation will work um so I, I started by birding in my backyard and then I joined a local birding group and went out on their bird walks. Um, that was a fantastic way to um, find other birders, get people to teach me birding because birding um, can be hard. There's lots of birds out there trying to figure out what they are. Um, but what really got me going was I went on vacation to Costa Rica and I was just going to have fun in Costa Rica, but I stayed at a couple eco lodges. I um, mean, lo and behold, there were birds in Costa Rica and I ran across this guy and that is a purple honey creeper and it is just a gorgeous, gorgeous bird. And there were birds like this all over the place and the, the lodges would set out fruit. The birds would come in, eat the fruit, just hang out. Um, so you could get great views of them, see them, and they were just gorgeous birds. And once I saw the birds in Costa Rica, um, I just wanted to see more and more very colorful, beautiful birds. Um, so from there, I went, I started bird going on um, other birding excursions. I went to a lot of places and um, Central America to Panama and to Belize, um, back to Costa Rica and stayed at birding lodges just to be able to um, view the beautiful birds and we'd go out, wander around the lodge or go on to um, short excursions away from the lodge, um, but it was just looking at beautiful, beautiful birds. And then I went um, to Cuba on an organized birding trip. And that was fantastic. We were on a bus driving around to all the different parts of Cuba and getting to see different birds. And I ran across these guys. And that was the first time I had seen actual live American flamingos. We call them pink flamingos, but the, the real name are American flamingos. And my previous exposure with these guys was as plastic things on people's front lawns. So it was just gorgeous to see whole flocks of them um, in some of the tidal pools around around um, Cuba. Um, where do I like to go birding around Hilton Head? Um, I love the National Wildlife Refuges. Well, we're so lucky to have so many of them very, very close to us. Pickney is one of the favorites. I think Kay was talking about she's actually the captain of the Christmas bird count there. Um, Savannah National Wildlife Refuge is actually in South Carolina, just north of Savannah. Um, they have a wonderful drive. It's currently closed. Um, they're doing some work on the, the water features over there. That's a wonderful place. Um, Ace Basin, mm -hmm. a little bit north of us, is wonderful. And of course, the Audubon New All Preserve. Um, I highly recommend the Tuesday bird walks over there. It's great to go out and bird with somebody that knows what they're seeing and can teach you and get you introduced. Um, but also just birding on the golf courses, birding on the beaches, um, lots of wonderful places right around here. Um, one of the questions Tamara had for me was, what um, do I use to keep track of my birds? And my go-to is eBird. And what eBird is, is a massive database that has been organized by the Cornell, Cornell University um, up in New York, their ornithology department. And what they do is have birders input data about birds they've seen into their database and they give you wonderful apps and um, uh, computer programs on their website and stuff to do that. And they'll tell you what birds should be there so you it's very helpful to know what you might be looking at. Um, uh, what, um, and then you record the birds and that data goes into their database and they then publish that information so you can see where birds are, what birds people have seen. And this is a map of all the eBird sightings in the world. 
Um, and the red is where the most species are. Um, green are sightings, but not so many species. So you can see in northern South America, that's where most of the bird species in the world are located. Um, Colombia has 1800 bird species just in that one small little country, but it has lots of different habitats. It has good biodiversity, um, so it's good at attracting species. You can see the United States is filled in a lot. Lots of people go birding in the US, so there's lots of bird sightings. Um, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, not a lot of birds in the middle of the desert. Um, and then another sparse area is the Siberia over in Russia. There's definitely birds there, there's sightings, but there's not a lot of people birding over there. Yeah. to the next slide, it's not working. Okay, um, one of my favorite birds is the bobolink. I like just to say the word bobolink, it sounds fun, um, but it's a, it's a fun bird, it, it, it's really good looking. The picture I have here is of the male, um, and I saw that at Savannah National Wildlife Refuge on May 1st. Um, to get there, um, it took a very, very long trip. So it lives down in Paraguay um, during our winter, which would be their summer. So that's where it spends December, January, February. It doesn't like staying in the US then. But I saw it in um, South Carolina in May. So it had a long trip to get there. And let me see if I can get this to work. This is a migration map from eBird, so all the different sightings that people have put in have allowed the scientists who work with the eBird data to put this together, which I just find fascinating. So this is the bird moving throughout the whole year. So it's going up to northern United, the northern United States and then coming back to Paraguay. So when I see it in um, South Carolina, it's maybe there a month, um, but its whole purpose is to get up to the breeding grounds in the northern United States. So even though I'm just a birder, I'm going out, I'm having fun, I'm um, enjoying myself, I'm also contributing data so scientists can put stuff like this together. Um, so when they start to do conservation studies, for this bird to survive, they need to make sure that what's going on down in Paraguay, that it has a stable environment. Um, it's in just a, a, one small little country there compared to where it breeds. So Kay was alluding to this before that um, the success of keeping bird populations alive depends upon an entire hemisphere, um, not just what we do in our backyard. Um, so Tamara was talking about a big year um, last year for 2020, since I was supposed to be in Namibia, but I'm not, I'm still in Hilton Head, I spent time going birding, and I packed up my Subaru and I drove west, and I, my goal was just to go to as many fascinating places that didn't have people um, as I could, so I spent a lot of time um, going to National Wildlife Refuges and forests. Um, thankfully, my Subaru is very comfortable to sleep in. I spent as much time camping as I could, again, to avoid people. Um, but I basically drove from South Carolina to Texas to Oregon and then back. Um, I wanted to see as many different um, species as birds as I could, birds I hadn't seen before, but also to hit as many different states. So what this map is, is from eBird, and it shows which states I have birded in. The darker red ones are where I've seen more birds. Um, Virginia, that's where I'm from originally. Texas, because there's a lot of birds in Texas. Um, and then all the various states. So the only place I haven't have eBirds is up in the Northeast because of due to COVID, that was basically closed down. So I couldn't get up there. Um, when it comes to birding, there's lots of resources out there um, for people to look at. Um, one of the 
ones I enjoy looking at is the Cornell Lab. They have a bird academy. Um, they have both free content and content you have to pay for. Um, but they have some wonderful online classes that you can um, use to really get to know particular types of birds or just birding in general. Um, birding guidebooks are very useful when you go out birding so you know what you're looking at. Um, thankfully, the Audubon app is free. You can download it to your phone. So when you're out in the field, you have something right um, on your phone that you can get pictures to look at. The Merlin, Merlin is an app um, also by Cornell that you can download to your phone. You put in some basic details. They'll ask you questions about the color of the bird, the size of the bird. Um, where did you see it? Was it in a tree? Was it in the sand? Um, and it comes back with suggestions of the bird that you could, of the bird that you've seen, so you can um, figure out what you did see. So it's wonderful, especially for people new to birding. Um, the Hilton Head Audubon walks over at Newhall Preserve. Highly recommend those. Um, I use eBird not only to record what I see, but also to get information about where birds are located. Um, that's very helpful. And something that's come out fairly new is BirdNet. Um, it's an app where you can record what the bird is um, singing or what their call is, and it'll come back and tell you what the bird is. It's still in prototype, so it's not completely accurate, but it's well worth it. And one of my favorites I use quite a bit is a um, community group on Facebook called What's This Bird? If I see a bird that I don't know what it is, I put it onto the Facebook page and um, somebody on the group will come back and tell you what the bird is. And I'm going to close out with just some pictures of some birds um, I've seen that I've taken photos of that are just some of my favorites. This is the great egret. Um, this is one of the birds that brought about the Christmas bird count because it was um, hunted for um, its plumage for its feathers. And I love this picture because we see these birds a lot. They're out um, on the golf courses, they're out at Pickney, um, and normally I would go, eh, large white bird, yep, but this, just the green on its beak just really stands out for me, and it's, it really is just a beautiful bird. Sarah, can you talk a little bit about what type of uh, camera you're using when you're capturing these pictures? Um, seeing if I have have it around. It's not a, a big camera, but it has a lot. It's uh, oh, it's a Canon something or other. Um, sorry, I don't know. It's just my camera. Um, but I don't have a I don't have really great photography equipment. But it the key thing for me is it has a really good zoom, um, so it can get uh, up close to a bird without having to be that close. So it's Thank not you. a great. Great camera, camera, but it's got a good zoom on it. Um, this is a great horned owl. I took this photo when I was in Oregon. Um, we have these guys around here. They're not the ones you hear most often, especially on the island. Um, but I know there's a breeding pair um, on the old golf course, uh, Planners Row, that they're turning into a passive park. So these guys are around and they're just fun birds if you can get a look at one of them. This is the Eastern Bluebird. Um, I don't know how many times I look at this bird and I just go, what a beautiful bird. Just the colors of the blue and the, the chestnut chest, just gorgeous bird. These are fun birds for me. Um, they're white ibises. They're only in the southeastern part of the United States, so we never had them up in Virginia. So every time I see one, I'm like, oh, it's white ibis. And they run around the golf course in packs. Um, but they're kind of funny looking, but still very pretty birds. And this is a ruddy duck. And what I love about him is his blue beak. So this is a male in breeding plumage. So we get them around here, but we get the winter version, which has no blue beak and it's not as bright. Um, so we don't get ones that look this gorgeous, but they still come here. Sarah, we have a question about what is the common owl on the island? Uh, barred owl. 
and they're breeding right now or getting ready to breed they're mating so they are very loud i have a couple that live about two doors down from me and every night they're chatting to each other um, are sandhill cranes and this picture was taken out in new mexico at a national wildlife refuge um, where they get 10,000 of them in a field at a given time. And these guys show up in South Carolina as well. I've seen them at Santee National Wildlife Refuge, which is 95, um, a couple hours up 95. And I've seen about 10 there, not quite 10,000, but still a fun bird to watch. And this is a great sage rouse. It's out in Colorado. Um, it likes sage prairie. And this is a male. Um, and he is um, doing his dance to attract females. And I went out there to Colorado with a friend and we went out to the lek first thing in the morning, you get out there while it's still dark. Um, and then these guys all show up and um, the day we were there, there were 78 males and two females. So he was really, really having to dance to get any action that day. Um, and this is just a bird I find gorgeous. It's another Western bird. It's a yellow headed blackbird, very aptly named, um, but just the colors and the demarcation between its head and the rest of its body is, is always fascinating to me. And these are great pandas from China. That's one of the places I went birding, did a birding tour, but also found time to visit the giant panda sanctuary. So whenever I go birding, I always try to see other things and do other things. And that's one of the beauty of going birding is you get to go to fascinating places and see fascinating creatures other than birds. That's it for me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Applause, everybody. Um, we had just one other uh, question come in um, that Jan and uh, Kay were chatting about. Uh, Jan's comment was she had had trouble with eBird and Merlin. Uh, she finds the apps as a new birder a bit frustrating. Uh, the question was, could Hilton had Audubon sponsor training on how to use them? And Kay said, great idea. Uh, Sarah, do you have any uh, tips of the trade on using the apps? Um, no, but I've used them for so long. It For me, it's second nature. Um, the Merlin one has changed over the years. Um, when I first used it, I wasn't all that impressed, but um, for this talk, I, I went back on and used it. And um, whatever they did, it, it now is more user-friendly. Um, it really asks you the questions rather than you having to um, go and figure stuff out on your own. So it's, it's, it's I, I found it more intuitive now. Awesome. Well, Sarah has been a, a great friend to have at the other end of the phone when we're trying to identify a bird and uh, always is very helpful in, in uh, helping us figure it out. So thanks Sarah for um, getting us started collectively as we think about birding. Appreciate you uh, on the call today. You're welcome. Um, anybody have any final questions before we say goodbye? If we have no final questions, we're going to say goodbye. We appreciate everybody coming out today. Really appreciate Kay and Sarah for um, sharing their information with us today. And let's get outside. Spring is coming. It's time to go for a walk and let's enjoy our nature. Talk to you guys soon. See ya. Thank you.